back to your question. I think um, first, you know, whether you want to be part of that ecosystem or not, you you have to um, assess whether it's the right fit or not. I think they had exciting news in terms of partnerships, sponsorships, but uh, looking at the viewership and the development of the game, I think uh, w one has to see where the league actually goes. Mm. Mick, I mean, you've made an incredible career out of sort of the understanding gamers, building the Faceit platform. How does how do you think something like Overwatch League has performed um, uh, uh, compared to the hype that, that that was sort of brought around it at the beginning? Well, definitely they took um, everything to the next level in terms of scale, uh, investment as well, uh, cost of operations, and commercially as well. I think they've been uh, uh, really successful in the first uh, couple of years, especially on the sponsorship side. They've, they've done like some really good deals with uh, uh, large brands that has never, you know, have never touched esports before. So that's great for the industry overall. I think obviously everyone's seen the. Um, you know, the Twitch deal um, that they did originally, uh, I think that's going to be uh, expiring at the end of this year. So, um, uh, and the ESPN deal as well, right? So, I think uh, this is, the, this is the, 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 the real moment. Like, we're, we're really going to see uh, how much of that they're going to be able to retain and, and to, you know, confirm moving forward. Um, and, um, you know, I would say, like you know, on the sponsorship side, I think they're definitely in a pretty solid position. Uh, I think the media rights landscape has changed quite a bit in the last couple of years, especially in the digital side. Um, so it's going to be challenging to retain the level of revenues that they have today. Um, but we'll see. I mean, they surprised us once already. So. Alban, you've got a, a, a very interesting background, uh, coming from sort of a, a behemoth of a, a non-endemic sponsor and then coming over sort of gamekeeper turned poacher in this respect i guess uh working for riot how does a franchise league um how, how does that affect the way a sponsor might look at um uh, uh, at supporting um a league um <clears throat> I, I don't think it's it, it make a huge difference for them uh because the biggest difference is like a tournament versus the league that's a major uh, like shift uh, on the league side, you have like a, a yearly program and you can guarantee the best team will be there all year long. And every Friday, every Saturday, they know they can connect and watch uh, with some finals at the end. So that format fits very well with the marketing campaign, I think. Uh, tournaments is more kind of like a peak. And, and, and I think it's, it's a, probably a different job to present this to, to sponsors such as Non-Endemic. Uh, the the long-term partnership, the relationship we have with the team owners, the fact that we guarantee the long-term sustainability of the ecosystem is interesting where we start to kick in uh, uh, multi-year deals and mm -hmm. things like that because uh, in other environments uh, you don't know if you're going to be qualified for the next season if you're relegated so i think it's more on the on the team side maybe that this new model have the biggest impact because they can finally guarantee to their sponsors that they could be there for the next three years or five years and that's a, a huge shift from the previous system where Three months in advance, they were not secure to be in the league after this mm. one. Yeah, and Robbie, I guess commercializing um, the, your, the, the great events that you guys put on around the world. Um, do you do you think that there's working with a game like CS:GO, which is a very open game? Do you think there are challenges there in, in the way that you commercialize um, your tournaments versus, for example, if you are working on commercializing a more sort of um, sustained uh, league system that Albon was talking about? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, ultimately there's a lot of competition in the space and um, that then could end up meaning, uh, I might be stuck, I think I'll turn myself off, a uh, lot, of, lot of competition in the space and uh, that could also lead to a race to the bottom. Um, so ultimately, you know, if you're not selling your media rights at the, the highest possible level and your competitor is out there selling them and, and selling them cheaply, uh, then, you know, the likes of people who want to acquire it can, can end up paying a very cost-effective price. Um, and we need to sort of retain that level of premium. Um, but in, and at the same time, there's a lot of competition for sponsors out there. Um, you know, we obviously focus a lot on trying to position ourselves as a very premium product, and then alongside that, you get the sponsors that come in that direction. Uh, but the fact that it's open uh, does help sort of commercial deals. Um, 
I, you know, I'm also quite new to this space and, and my eyes are always sort of wide open and looking at the, the, the endemic brands that are there, but then the non-endemic brands that are entering in. And, and, I, and I think we're, we're moving in that direction. It, it's, it's slow, but it's getting there and getting them to pay, you know, higher amounts of money because they're getting more value, right? And yeah. I think that's the important part. It's not just a logo slapped on a screen or slapped on a backdrop. It's got to be a bunch load more and content's got to live through off the back of it. Yeah. Um, Mick, from a business perspective, I think there's a lot of uh, businesses in esports over the last 15, 10 years perhaps that there, by the grace of Valve, go they. Um, that <laughs> because of uh, Valve's very open nature and its very open license for the game, a lot of the esports industry has allowed, you know, a lot of it's allowed to, to, to thrive because of that. Do you think sort of game publishers being more protective over their intellectual property or wanting to own ecosystems actually has a negative effect on um, entrepreneurship in the, in the space? There's definitely pros and cons to you know the, all the different models. If you look at a franchise model like uh, Riot has or you know Overwatch now, you know Call of Duty, there's um, clearly strong uh, benefits from a commercial standpoint because you have a very clear centralized product, so it's very easy to explain it to any potential commercial partners. Um, and um, there's like a more long-term guarantees, right? It's it's hard to say in current strike, like what's gonna uh, what's going to happen next year in Counter Strike, right? It's uh, still uh, a bit confusing right now. We have some rumors, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, so it's it, it has a lot of benefits from that standpoint. I can also from a from a team standpoint, it allows them to invest more in the in the long term mm -hmm. um, because they have more guarantees around their you know presence in uh, in that product. At the same time, I think there's a um, some potential drawbacks when it comes to um, the community side and uh, the, the grassroots and creation of new talent because effectively when you're creating a closed system at the top um, you're almost eliminating the connection between uh, the professional layer and all the grassroots and amateur and semi-professional um, and um, I think over time we'll see obviously like all these new franchises are, are quite new so will take years to see like the real impact at the same time i think uh, it's critical for all the um, publishers that decide to go in that direction to invest really heavily in maintaining a, a healthy you know grassroots ecosystem um, and uh, you know different programs like you know one example of right obviously has a number of like national leagues uh, which are quite successful in europe um, they have a scouting grounds program um, we actually, you know, recently partnered with uh, uh, Riot in North America to support the scouting ground program as well and build like a, a clear path to pro uh, for League of Legends players. And I think this kind of initiatives like um, are, are going to be critical to sustain the, uh, the games in, in the long run. While can I can I light there quickly on the um, and actually Anna, I want to ask you in, in, a, in a franchise system, where does the talent come from? We saw, you know, last weekend, Berlin Major, Avant Garde, Kazakhstan team right. that had really off the radar um, and was not, you know, no one was really, it was on anyone's radar, come and challenge Astralis. Um, where does the talent come from in a franchise system? Um, obviously, it's quite different to CSGO, for example, where you will see a roster shuffle after every big event, basically, new teams forming up. But basically, even looking at this, you know, some of these players have been around for quite a while and very successful. So it's not that they appeared out of nothing, basically. They competed at the very top for quite some time. In a franchise like, and, and for us as a team, it's, it's quite important, as Mick highlighted, that you actually grow deeper roots into the territory where you are, that you are able to develop talent. Um, but no one is scouting in Kazakhstan for, you know, there are no <laughs> scouts in Kazakhstan, right? No, um, we're scouting, uh, well, usually at the semi-pro level, mm -hmm. um, since in the LSE format you also have a secondary team in one of the national leagues. We're quite happy in uh, Poland and it's very exciting, the talent there, the fans, everything, you immediately get a closer connection to a community as well. Um, which we which we quite enjoy, and then of course on top of that, um, we think about additional formats we can even host as a team or together with other partners when it comes to scouting grounds. Um, just um, not only 
I think with the goal to um, to scout talent, but I think it's also important to inspire new talent, what it can look like to be a mm. pro, so also to connect to the community via that tool. Yeah. Um, Alban, you'll be very quick to correct everybody on the panel that uh, the, the riot system isn't exactly a franchise system. It's more of a, how would you describe long -term it? Long-term partnership. A long-term partnership. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Took us a year. Do you think... Um, Does someone know the difference? No? <laughs> so franchise model, like McDonald's, they give the name and the brands to the store owners, like most of the leagues in the US. Uh, a long-term partnership is we partner. We wanted to partner with Rogue, we wanted to partner with G2 and Fnatic. We didn't want them to rebrand and create something else. Mm. So that's a different vision of the way we connect the relationship with the owners. They had to pay for the privilege though, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's not a franchise. <laughs> All right. So, um, do you, I mean, look, um, everybody understands the, the power of League of Legends. Um, uh, do you think it would have been um, any less successful or more successful had it have been a bit more of an open uh, Valve model, let's say, perhaps, than the sort of closed franchise-ish -ish model? Well, it's, it's very difficult to answer because it's, it's so many parameters you have to change then. Um, you have to think, like, the right game's vision uh, is, is, is putting eSports at the core. We, we believe in a multi-generation game that is inspired by the pros to, to nurture the future talents. So for that, it's very close to what I've seen in sports when I was working previously with Coca-Cola, where you have the, the vision of the top events with like the World Championship and the MSI. You got the Continental, continental Leagues, which we have 14, mm. not just one, like we have 14 Continental Leagues, one in China, one in Vietnam, one in Australia, one in Russia, one in Europe. And then we, as you mentioned, also invest in the future, which is like, how can we allow gifted players to find a way to reveal themselves and to be picked for the bigger team. So that's the 14 national teams we have in Europe now. Mm. Um, so, so this is a long-term vision. Uh, it's difficult for me to extract one parameter like, oh, are we doing a, a close environment in Europe? Will that change the League of Legends success or future? It's difficult to answer. Mm. What we can say is that the leagues that we have decided to close in a way at the highest level have performed better in mm. terms of like viewership in terms of engagements and, and submitting fandom for the, for the teams. And it's also a check and balance because we, we didn't do that decision without thinking what we're going to do for the national leagues. And, and when we see that 60% of the players of the top leagues played in the national leagues in the last 12 months, mm. we believe that we have a very open system actually yeah. for the players, not for the teams. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So I want to ask a little bit of a question about the business model of a fran franchise team. And I want to pose a hypothetical question. Let's say I, uh, we own a, a franchise team together. Or a long-term partnership team. Or we, no, we have a long-term partnership team <laughs> together. Uh, and um, we have a player in the team who is, let's say, the David Beckham of the team. He isn't very good. He's all right. Uh, he used to be quite good. He, he's but he's very good looking. He's struggling at the moment. He's very good looking. He's in the newspaper every day. He's very exciting. He drives us a lot of revenue. Uh, we get a lot of people watching our team play because they want to see him play. We get a lot of people tweeting us on social media because of what he gets up to. And we get lots of big sponsorship partnership deals because of who he is. There's no incentive for us to replace him on the team with someone who's better. So our team might always be in the middle of the table. Um, because we want to, our, our, we're making money, we're making revenue, and we don't want to replace him. What's the incentive, I think, is the question to you for us to get rid of him and to have the best team? Winning. But, it, but why does that matter in a, franchi in a franchise league? I mean, in every s competitive environment, I would not use sports in this arena right there, but winning helps, helps everything. Helps getting the future players to want to play for your team, Helps the fans to get engaged. It's the sponsors. So you don't to think that the finances make any sort of bearing in your decision on that? Ask Carlos if he will be okay to lose last weekend against Fnatic. Mm. You know, I, I saw him in the in, in 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 the in the stadium. He was like super passionate. He was already qualified for Worlds. He had all the passion already from a very successful season, but he wanted to win this final game. I think we all believe in this this idea that you know we're here to to perform at the highest level. So every you, player is every that coach wants to win. And, and I think that even if um, it's not a franchise system, I mean, this weekend in Moscow, right? So simple with playing his last ever game with Zeus, right? And they, 
they tanked, right? They, they didn't. And did Simple want to win? Of course Simple wanted to win, right? Best player in the world wants to show his home team fans that he's there. And that does wonders for his brand. So, I mean, I get the David Beckham analogy, but if United weren't like the best team in Europe at that time, then he really probably wouldn't have stayed there. Mm. And, you know, you can have footballers or esports players that are playing for team number 10 in a franchise league, partner league. You, you would probably find that that player would move at a certain point in time because they're not getting the exposure they need and actually that's really important like the exposure point for brands is super super important so if a team's not winning is not exposed all the time at semi-finals quarter-finals semi-finals finals in a league system or a tournament series system brand goes like that yeah by the way we had many examples of that i mean like we had reckless which is the most Mm -hmm. you know, well-known players of League of Legends in Europe, if not top five in the world, who said, you know what, I'm not good enough. I can't play with this meta and decided to bench himself. Yeah. Not even his coach, you know. And, and I have experiences this year with like players such as Kassing and, and some top players from, the, from some teams and they decided to play the academy team on the bigger stage and guess what, it works. So I think it's, uh, it's still an environment where people want to win. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, it, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, we're talking about sort of the sports analogy. Obviously, the franchising, I think, comes from traditional sports, and, and esports is a, is, a, is a purely digital phenomenon that I think many would argue transcends games and, and sports. Um, you know, do you think that we're, we're, we're clinging to archaic sort of formats um, for things that are built around things like gate attendance and the way that traditional sports have, have, have grown up? Uh, or do you think that we should be completely rewriting the rules here and rewriting the way that we look at sort of tournaments and leagues and cups and, and competitions because it's a purely digital medium? I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure you guys have also got an opinion on that, but I think we have to, right? Because otherwise it's not sustainable. If you, if you as a, a tournament organizer just rely on gate attendance and merchandise sales, you will not make a business from that, right? right? You've got to be able to rely on broadcast deals, on sponsorship deals, and you've got to be able to diversify what your product offering is. And for me, that's all about story t storytelling and storytelling throughout the year. And I think that also comes back down to the point around talent that you were talking about before. I think that if you can tell stories around talent that are up and coming, and you can tell that in non-endemic press and get the Beeb or whoever it is in the given country to focus on John from Bromsgrove that's becoming an amazing player, then we're going to be talking about an ecosystem that's worth way more than the news news stats or Goldman Sachs stats point out today. Well, I think, first of all, sports is, is much more diverse than people think it is. Like, if you analyze the business model of Formula One, it's closer to ours. If you analyze the tennis model or the football model, it's very different. So I think we, are, we all take inspiration from the sports. Yeah, there's 100 years of experience there, and we should be crazy not to. Yeah. But at the same time, we have to reinvent ourselves and also take advantage of a few things that we do differently and sometimes better. Mm. Like the way we interact with, with our fans and our players online, the way we connect grassroots with elites, for the fact that every share the same game and digitally can connect directly, is something that we should leverage, mm. and we do. Um, there's been a little bit of talk, and, and I think it's slightly unfair actually, because when we talk about franchise, really we're, we're putting Activision Blizzard in our in our sights here a little bit, uh, because they've been the most bullish in the market. Um, this idea of sort of home stadiums or home arenas, and, and, and an idea of these physical locations in each city, do we think that's the utopic future that uh, esports is moving to, or? I think it's an interesting question because we look at this from a team perspective. Um, with regards to brand presence, fandom, and I think there is one of the main drivers, for example, to decide for Call of Duty here in London and for, for the guys here in the UK, because it seems looking at the market, this you know could be very smart to connect to this massive fan base. We gained 10,000 followers on Twitter in three days. That's, I mean, not many teams can say that, so that's quite cool. Um, however, it, it also depends on, on, on the system you're looking at. For example, League of Legends has been a phenomenon where the ecosystem has been built not necessarily attached to locations. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing here kind of a transition currently happening with the national leagues. I think from, from the fan and, and commercial perspective, we get a very positive response. But it's also, it's also a bit trial and error really um, developing 
um, the economic model around that. I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an old saying that I quite like, it's the medium is the message. And it almost feels like the game need, have it, has its own kind of, um, it, it needs to have its own organic sort of, the, 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 system, the esports system around it needs to be right for the game. And I think with Overwatch, it, you know, it was a very visually friendly, very game. It was a very open game. It had sort of a, you know, there, the, when you were shot, for example, it didn't look like you know Call of Duty does when you get shot, for example, <laughs> which was a, which was probably one of the reasons why they were so aggressive about um, putting it out there in the way that they did. Um, going back to sort of Call of Duty World League, do we think that the, because of the nature of that game, because it has a, um, a Peggy 18? Um, rating on it, for example, does that affect the way that the audience are going to interact with the game or the way, the way that we need to promote it as an eSport? I, I don't oh, necessarily card, think so. Obviously, <laughs> you know, we have lots of uh, CSGO people sitting here on the stage as well. I think, of course, you need to be respectful of what's the regulatory framework there and be conscious about it. But um, I think apart from that, it's, um, it's part of the esports family. It's very exciting. I think um, it has a, a massive player base. So in terms of uh, just looking at the customer you're connecting to, yes, you're looking at, at a grown-up crowd, basically. And of course, you're going to face regulatory challenges when it comes to broadcasting, for example. But apart from that, I, I don't think you know, that's, that's a problem at all. Everybody agree with that? Yeah, obviously it has uh, some additional challenges compared to a game like a, you know, League of Legends or you know, maybe Overwatch, even if like, some people mm just uh, define every first person shooter as gunplay, even Fortnite, they consider it, you know, not safe for a uh, younger audience. That's like everyone, and that's, that's the other challenge, right? Like everyone has a, uh, you know, different measurement stick for um, uh, games when it comes to like, is it safe for my brand or not safe? So yeah, there's um, definitely, you know, brands that are gonna tell you like this game uh, doesn't fit our brand. Mm. Uh, I don't think that happens much with League of Legends. Uh, a lot more so with uh, people are fine with spells. Kind of it's good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so yeah, there, 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 there are challenges uh, around that. I think it's also uh, you know mostly about um, uh, education. Like most most of the brands are not really educated about esports and not uh, they don't even understand the nuances of uh, of the different games. And uh, it takes time for them to, to get comfortable with it. While at the same time, obviously, like on television, you have like a watershed. You, you need to respect certain rules when it comes to like red blood. Uh, but every, everything can be done. If you have, uh, you know, boxing and UFC as a, some of the you know, most watched and successful commercially uh, properties in, in the world, I don't see why, you know, Counter-Strike or yeah. Call of Duty... Yeah, I would agree. I agree with that. I mean, I think it's all about the way that you integrate that brand into the sponsorship or the broadcast. Like that—that that is key. And I think that again, I'm new to this ecosystem, and I think we've come a long way. And I think we can go way further. And I think that if we start being clever about how we produce content, how we position that content, the brand wants to be engaged because there's a sitting audience, because they're the right age group, etc. But I think that if there's an entertainment angle that's associated with that, I think that will make a massive difference. Um, so we really think about that entertainment angle. I mean, this weekend I was standing there with the, with the lady from 20th Century Fox in Moscow. And she's like, this was insane. I couldn't believe it. I've sent it around the world, she said. And yeah, of course, movies should be... I mean, I was, when I arrived, I was like, movies? Where's the movies? Come on, let's get the movies on board. They've got to be all over it. I don't think we'll see my old employer Disney on board in, in say, CSGO. <laughs> but, uh, but maybe there's another space for them. Well, isn't the Team Liquid and Marvel... Um, uh, yeah, that's true, yeah. Um, so I think we've talked a lot about um, the, the, the franchise side of things and the closed side of things. Um, one of the biggest criticisms of an open system and a Valve's uh, ecosystem for the last couple of years is you've had a lot of players in the space. So you've had sort of incumbents like ESL, DreamHack, you've had Blast, you've had um, ECS, you've had um, E-League getting in as well, right? So you had a lot. I mean, I think 2017, 2018 were very crowded years mm -hmm. for big stadium esports tournaments around the world and 250, 500k plus prize monies. Is that, uh, really, is that really a problem, do we think, in the long term, or uh, with this sort of idea of team fatigue, or not, you know, if 
fanatic and um, Navi have played f 15 times this year, is that a problem? Or, 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 or is it something that actually should be embraced as we move forward and um, the market will sort of settle itself? It, it shouldn't be a problem. It, it is right now just because people are not necessarily like educated or like a, even playing fair in different parts of the ecosystem, whether that's like, you know, organizers, teams, players. Um, and uh, also, I think this, we're, we're in a phase in esports where there's a lot of um, uh, mainstream attention. There's a lot of uh, investment coming from all over the places. Uh, and uh, it's hard for, you know, for people to understand. For example, if I'm an investor today and I'm not interested in investing in a team, then um, the pretty much the only uh, other sp place I can put my money is uh, Counter-Strike or, or Dota, where there's an open ecosystem. I cannot invest in, in Riot directly, right? It's not a public company or you know, raising money right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> to invest in Tencent, but. Yeah. yeah. You can buy shares. Sure. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, for venture capital or, you know, private equity funds uh, or even like uh, high net worth individuals, um, there's, uh, you know, now a lot of money that uh, gets uh, directed towards, uh, you know, Counter-Strike and, uh, and Dota just because they're, um, you know, open markets. Yeah. And, for me, it comes down to the word scarcity, right? Um, I think that if we can focus, I mean, and, and, and Mick and I work closely, right? We make sure that from a TO perspective, we're not treading on each other, and that, and that works well. But that there's a good relationship there. It doesn't al it's not always the same everywhere, right? So I think that if we can get to a place where we're ensuring that the greatest and the best teams in the world are playing in the biggest products in the world, then we're in a good space. And whilst retaining that rags to riches story that you saw happen in Berlin, we saw happen this weekend in Moscow again, like that's super important for the ecosystem. Um, what I think is hard is if the players have got to fly all around the world all the time and pick up $5,000 here and $10,000 there. Absolutely. That's not going to work. Um, and, and I think... You know, that's why, I mean, we, we came out this weekend with a big announcement around prize pool. We, we want to try and incentivize them to play the biggest and the greatest because I think that that means that they're going to create the scarcity and improve their brand perception as a yeah. consequence. Yeah. I think a lot of teams of players still have this uh, uh, FOMO where they think uh, this, is, uh, this is all great. They have uh, this many tournaments and prize money and so on. But if they don't participate today, that money might be lost forever. Mm -hmm. and, and so they have this, you know, you look at some of the, maybe the best team in the world, like the top three teams in the world, you would think they, you know, should be very selective to the, the competitions they participate in, the tournaments they go to. And, you know, they're, they're just not. Like mm -hmm. some of them have been on the road last year for, um, 240 days, I believe. Um, yeah, it's, uh, of course, you know, you, you, you burn out if, uh, if you play like that. And also like, you know, devalue uh, all the products across the board. Yeah. I mean, one of the effects this open system has is that stakeholders actually get together and they um, find joint interests. For example, the sometimes, players... Some, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> they just work against each other or, you know, it's like, I, I understand, you know, um, um, the subtlety there. But when you look at the players, for example, I found this quite interesting that you have now a play union in CSGO, mm -hmm. which um, <clears throat> has negotiated, as far as I understand, with tournament organizers, that you have two breaks, basically, per year. And um, the common understanding is there shouldn't be any tournaments there. Of course, I also understand the commercial needs and connection to products, you know, might be sometimes different. But still, it's kind of interesting to see that um, this market has driven certain organizational forms um, further than closed systems, for example. Mm. Yeah. Um, just because they need to take care of themselves, whereas in a franchise system, you will already have sustainable rules in place, for example, such as minimum salaries, vacation times, whatever it is. Yeah. I might ask one more question if that's right, and then I think we'll open it up to the room for, for any questions you have. Um, do you think that there is a, um, a stigma attached in eSports? I know you're for very core to the industry people, but uh, so your opinion might be different. Do you think there's a stigma attached to the word franchise system within the eSports um, community? I believe that's why we didn't use it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think so. Um, because uh, particularly from a European perspective, 
um, the conversations I had been part of, you know, previous to the LEC long-term partnership, was that there is a very strong core belief here in Europe, you know, with our roots in sports, that um, franchise might be um, a system where competition is not the highest value. This might not be true because as we have seen, you know, also in the long-term partnership, winning is everything from a commercial perspective, from a, from a brand fandom perspective, it's really everything. Um, so I think there might be also a misunderstanding and um, people in Europe might need a bit more education on these closed I, systems. I, th I think so. It, it was, we were very scared about it. Mm. I mean, we are, not only we were decided to go from an open environment to a closed environment, but we also decided, because we are like gamblers maybe, to change the name of the league at the same time. So it was a big bet of like, okay, successful brand, biggest esports in Europe, let's get rid of that and change the name at the same time. A bit scary. Um, but we believe it. We believe that we, we can bring the best players, the best teams. We can also invest into the content and, and, and provide them more value as a fans. Mm. They would reward us. And that's what's happened, at least for this year. So I think it's, uh, it's up to us to demonstrate the value of it. Mm. Uh, I use a lot the example of Formula One. I think fans will not be super happy if Formula One get, would get rid of Ferrari <coughs> or like Williams or yep. like Mercedes. And I think it's kind of the same for us. Like we did a long-term partnership like Formula One has with the top teams in, in, in their business. And, and in a way to provide the best content in the show to the fans. And if we do so, I think they reward us. Gentlemen? Yeah, I think esports community are super afraid of, uh, of franchising, uh, especially if you look at you know, Counter-Strike, for example, or Dota or these other games that don't actually have one. Um, and uh, I would say, on one side, rightfully so, um, because they associate the franchising with uh, the lack of opportunity for emerging talent. Um, and uh, we, we all know that the reason why esports is so you know, great and beautiful is that everyone you know, from home can play a game and can become one of the best in the world. That's, it's that accessibility factor that is critical uh, for all of esports and, and the, the, the communities don't want that to be taken away. At the same time, I think we've, we've seen uh, that, um, that it's possible to create uh, franchises that still have that element of uh, uh, accessibility uh, from, uh, from, from the players and from the community uh, and have been quite successful. So, you know, hopefully we're, again, like it's, uh, it's more of a learning process for everyone to see how these models are evolving. And, um, um, now we have some some positive example. Sometimes I think it's also a bit of a you know propaganda. There's a, you know a few companies in the space that are just like a, a demonizing the word franchising just for you know personal interest, and that's uh, uh, a bit sometimes like you know influencing uh, the perception from you know community fans and so on. Robbie, would you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Um, so um, if anybody has a question, uh, now is your time to ask it. Um, I, I, I think if you put your hand up, someone will come to you with a microphone. I'm guessing that might not be the system. So uh, any questions from the floor at all? No. A very super attentive audience that just wants to listen to more. I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to, to answer the question you asked earlier on localization. Yeah. Legionization. Um, I, I don't think it's the future because it's already there. I mean, we have been testing this for the last 18 months in China. We have six stadiums across the country mm -hmm. that have home and away games. Um, and it's, it's marvelous. It's, it's China a, might be a unique market though, right? I agree, but it's, it's a pretty important one for us. So it's, it's, it's pretty significant. <laughs> so, so I would just say that it's not the future, it's already there. And, and for Europe in particular, it's a reality. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an untapped potential for us. Mm. But the way we can uh, untap, uh, unlock this potential may vary. Mm. And there's many ways to do it. And people get very stubborn and obsessed with this idea of home and away, which is probably the hardest way to, to unlock the potential because before you unlock the potential, you already invest a lot more money mm. to just make it happen uh, with the real estate and all these needs that you have. You should start to think about home and away. Not even talking about things you don't like, like production. Because trust me, remote production from studio to studio is not an easy one. So I would say that clearly this is the direction. Mm. Clearly it's a reality. But localization of content, uh, connection between national leagues and European league for us, 
like we did for the secondary team for more teams. Uh, having some events where two teams come together and play in the region where they have the biggest affinity. Yeah. There's many ways to unlock this potential that doesn't rely only on the home and away system. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I've just... We, ah, yes, hello. See, question. I knew it. Please. Yes, hi, I'm uh, Victor from Kingwin. Uh, I have actually two questions. One for Alban. Uh, are you considering uh, ex uh, expanding the franchise system beyond the existing uh, teams in the, in the, in the current uh, European or the American League? Yes. And the, all right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I might ask to how many. Considering, but, yeah. Um, the second question uh, to Michelle and Robbie. Are you considering actually any franchise leagues uh, of, your, of your own? I'm going to answer a bit more before, okay? <laughs> so, what we are saying, si since day one, we said that these 10 teams were the first one that we're going to build this long-term partnership with. We have seen in China that they are already expanded the league. Uh, in the US, there are some rotation in the slot with like, teams giving their, their slot to other, to other owners. So, we, we see a future where there's a potential for more slots. The time will be really decided as a collective with the team owners and the league to find the right moments where we feel that the sustainability that we're targeting for the teams that are already in the league is achieved, or at least we see, uh, we see the target coming, then we can expand in a, in a way that it doesn't diminish the, the potential of the existing teams. That's, that's a long version of my, my yes. Yeah. I think, am I working now? I fixed this on the fly. I feel very proud of myself. Good job. Um, uh, I think that the, we released our information yesterday around what Blast Premier looks like for 2020. Uh, this year, we've worked with certain partner teams. I think we will strive to work with the best teams in the ecosystem, the best brands, the biggest brands in Counter-Strike in 2020, whilst also making sure that that rags to riches story can still ring true. Um, and so we, we're very much f positioning ourselves as an entertainment product. Um, and that product relates best to the best teams in the world. The challenge is, uh, in Counter-Strike, is that you, you see that Rags to Riches story occur all the time. So Avangar was no, wasn't really anywhere in that ecosystem until the Berlin Major. They come up and then, well, how do you make sure you can integrate them into your format so that they get the chance to play? Um, and that's tough. And there's a lot of new institutions that are going to be coming into Counter-Strike in the coming 12 months. So I think we're going to see that move around quite a lot. And as a tournament organizer or an entertainment organization, uh, we just want to make sure that we're trying to work as hard as possible to play with those brands. Yeah, I guess like uh, the question is related to Counter-Strike uh, and other games, so I'll answer that. Um, there's a lot of uh, ongoing discussions with, right now with uh, uh, players, the Player Association, um, team owners and so on about like the, the, the current strike ecosystem, whether the, the current ecosystem is the, the best possible way or the, there's better models and so on. I think uh, on in particular, the consensus is um, that um, um, what makes current strike especially unique is having an open component and uh, the ability to always have uh, up and coming talent emerging and new teams uh, um, uh, being part of the of the overall system, so um, to answer your question, I don't think there is going to be a, a closed system in Counter Strike uh, anytime soon. Cool. Well, thank you. Look, as the saying goes, use it or lose it. Unfortunately, we've got thirty seconds left, so um, I'm just going to invite you now to uh, give um, Alba, uh, Mick, Robbie, and Anna a round of applause. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>